So welcome this morning. This is the teaching with mentorship in mind, how bringing your whole self to work can help students achieve session. Our presenter is Rebecca Charlton, who is an assistant professor in professional practice and has worked as a dietitian and educator for 20 years. Her career has carried her from obstetrics care clinics near the Mexican border to pediatric care at Children's Hospital Los Angeles before settling here at USU to teach medical nutrition therapy. So welcome, Rebecca, the time is yours. All right, thanks, JC, and you guys are filling in. I want you to take a second, pull out your phones. You have to participate with me or this is gonna get really boring. Um, so please pull out your phones and take this really brief survey before I advance the slide. Oh, I like seeing all of my A students with their phones out. That's so great. All right. So go ahead and take this so we can use this information as we move forward because we are going to talk about what it means to bring your whole self to the workplace, which I personally found a very terrifying idea when it started getting talked about, and we can move forward, but I don't like getting stuck behind this, so I'm gonna try to wander. All right, it's about to go away, so this would be like, you know, those of you who are my late adopters, if you want to grab that QR code, this is your last moment to do so. All right, five, four, three, two, one. And by the way, welcome to my people online. I don't want you to feel forgotten. Uh, sorry. All right, so here is a little demo of sometimes what we do to our students. So you've walked into my class and you essentially get this from my syllabi. Hello, I'm Rebecca Charlton. I teach medical nutrition therapy, which is the course you happen to be in, congratulations. Um, you can find me at this random Twitter account or maybe at an email. Welcome to my class, let's get started. How connected do you feel to me with that tiny little bit of intro? Not very. What would you like to know in order to know, like, am I a decent human being? Do I enjoy hurting students' feelings? <laughs> um, what is, and maybe you want to know my grading policy, but that's not really what you want to know. You want to know if my life falls apart, are you on my side? Okay. So when we, I'm talking to you about bringing your whole self to work, I want you to start thinking about those things. What signals am I giving to my class about who I really am as a person? So you've got your mentor quiz. That's your first pre-homework in 25 minutes. Your second is a sketch that I want you to just start doing either in your mind or on a piece of paper if you know the research about how art interacts with the way that we learn. But I have lots of students do this, where I want you to create a tree in your mind of who you are as a person. What are the things that formed who you are? Those are your roots. They go deep. Some of your roots are good and some of them might be really bad, okay? We can't ignore the bad or the good pieces because they all formed this trunk, which is our core value. This is the thing you may not violate about me or you go in the bad person column. Okay, you cannot disrespect that core value. You can't do it to yourself, and when others do it to you, you will immediately start to push them aside because that's how important your core value is. Do you know that about yourself? Do you know where that boundary lies? And then you start to think, what's in my leafy treetop here? What are the things this core value is driving for me? So, what formed my volumes? I have a wonderfully connected nuclear family headed by a teacher and a psychologist. Those were my parents. That idea of a loving, connected nuclear family is my 100% core value. You can tell me all you want about non-traditional families. I will support you and love you. But when it comes to me, having a nuclear family that all lives together in one house is very important to me. That has been manifested in my leafy treetop through things like adoption, um, fertility treatments, having a large family. I have four to nine children, depending on what's happening in the foster care system. 
okay? All of those things have been manifested because of my roots, which developed my core value, put me up in the trees, okay? Now, do you know more about me if you know that I'm a foster parent? I have a connected family, all right? Obviously, if I've done adoption, I've done some hard parenting. Have you discovered more things to connect to me maybe about? Some of you are probably still lost. You're like, look, lady, just get to the meat. I don't need to know everything about you in order to go on. And that's okay, because the other thing I want you to take, other than the fact that I really don't like presenting from PDFs, but that's feedback for another day. I want you to be thinking about who you are, not who I am. What are you offering as far as mentorship? Because we have some backwards ideas about what mentorship is or should be. Um, one of those ideas is that mentorship should be a super formalized, somewhat forced upon people relationship. Okay, this person comes to you, you are now forced to be their mentor. It does not matter if you connect at all, mentor happily. That isn't actually going to be successful. So I'm gonna tell you a story, um, and it's a personal story, and I'm gonna to try to keep those to a minimum because I know our time together is short. But I came to a job, and really, honestly, I'm a good talker. You probably figured that out by now. I kind of talked my way into this job. And I did it mostly because I thought, I'm gonna go and interview for this job, and then I will know what that job is like. And in the future, when I feel prepared for that job, I will go back and get that job. And then they hired me. And I said, oh boy, I am not ready for this job. And I know I'm not ready for this job. And my imposter system was screaming in my head that I was not ready for that job. And so I came and I decided to be humble and I said, I really could use a mentor. And they said, oh, we have this wham bam man mentor. They're so great. It was the worst mentoring experience of my life. We practically destroyed each other. Um, I also had some hidden trauma, which is part of why this is a really important topic to me. And everything that poor woman did trounced all over my trauma. I have come to realize she was not purposefully trying to hurt me, but at the time it was hurting me. And I kept trying to say this to her and then she kept mentoring harder. And the more she mentored, the more damaged I got. And pretty soon I didn't believe in myself and she didn't believe in herself and we were just in a mess. And a lot of that came because of this misunderstanding of what mentoring can or should be, which should be a really dynamic interaction, but it needs to start with some reason we connect as people, okay? So as we talk about bringing your whole self to work, I want you to think about what is this person I put forward so that those of you out there in my audience recognize that I might be a good mentor for you rather than me trying to mentor every single one of you, which most of you, maybe many of you, wouldn't even like that much, I want to find the one of you who is looking for me. Because that's where those meaningful interactions come from. So to get you guys thinking again and get us moving, tell me some things that have changed for you in the past two years. I don't know, it's been a simple two years for everybody, right? <laughs> tell me, what are some things that maybe disrupted your worldview a little bit? I moved from the East Coast to Logan, Utah. Good gravy. Moving from East Coast to Logan, Utah. Yeah, that definitely probably shook a few things. During a pandemic. During a pandemic, yeah. Yeah, I was going to leave the pandemic out, but yeah. No, it was not our best time. That's all I can say. What else? My 28-year-old, now 30-year-old moved home. Oh, so going from being, yeah, having kids move back home when you were in the middle of the transition, perhaps to empty nesting and not doing that every day? I hear it's lovely. Um, <laughs> what else? Yeah, that's a big transition. What other changes happened? Yeah. Taking care of my elderly mother by myself during a pandemic. Oh, becoming a caregiver during a pandemic. Yeah, that's not a fun one. Had a nephew diagnosed with cancer and then my own baby was born with serious lung issues during a pandemic. For about a year and a half, all I could see was like terrifying things everywhere, okay? So yeah, these things happen to us. And sometimes we give ourselves grace that we don't like to give other people. So we recognize that our work is not isolated from our life. 
I work here, but I'm worried about my baby. I work here, but I'm worried about my mom at home and all of these students and whether or not they're vaccinated. Our students are also whole people. And what we know from research into trauma and brain research and all these cool things we talk about at ETE is that no one really has the ability to check their lives at the door. So sometimes we forget also that people come to us with unresolved issues or they're dealing with something currently. Who had more temper tantrums in class that year we came back from the pan pandemic than they'd ever had among adult learners before? Go ahead. I felt like I was dealing with one every day. I recognized my students really didn't hate me any more than they had hated me before. Like it was a nice baseline, but they were in a different place. And so even though I was doing the same things, those things were in a different world now. My students needed me in a different way. All right, well, I would like for one second, as you look at this infographic behind me, tell me what you think this looks like in a classroom. So this is really looking about trauma, but it can be neurodivergence, it can be complicated ADHD. There's lots of different things that create almost the same sequelae in people's brains. What does this look like among students? What do you think? It can look like a student who's terrified to speak out in class because they don't agree with them. Yeah, a student who won't speak up even though you know that they probably have the answers or you wouldn't do anything. I mean, I don't think most of us throw things at students when they get it wrong, right? So it's really a low stakes activity, but it's still terrifying. Did I see another hand? What else can this look like? Yeah, that student who is so busy begging for attention that you almost have nothing to give anybody else. Yeah, a student who disappears. Won't speak back, won't respond to emails, won't come to office hours. They just disappear. Or they sit there and they're gone. You have a few of those. Like, even when they're present, you're like, wow, you and I could live on different continents and we'd be getting exactly the same amount of communication. Was there more? Uh, also the students who have developed sexual coping mechanisms that you wouldn't be able to tell, but are struggling with silence. Yeah. So one of the least understood among the lay people is the idea, go away, thank you, of fawning. Um, fawning is doing everything perfect so that your social group loves you. And we didn't even recognize this as a response to trauma until about the last five years. And so I adopted from foster care. My daughter is an excellent fawner. She is so great. You would meet her and think she had been raised in a core biological family. Nothing ever went wrong in this girl's life. And then as you get talking to her, you realize she checked off the trauma checklist by age seven. So we are constantly digging down and being like, it's okay to do things that upset people. And she's like, whoa, no, you don't know how this works. And I'm like, it is, make mom mad. I'm still gonna love you tomorrow. And those have been big steps. So another myth as we work with students though is that trauma is this thing we can never fix and so we just have to avoid all triggers all the time. It's actually a super unhealthy place to put a trauma, a person who's been traumatized or a person with neurodivergence in. While we want to be aware of moments where we might start losing them, <laughs> Managing their triggers is what leads to healing. So we can't create a world with no triggers. I shouldn't be so afraid to do things that I'm constantly changing everything I do. Now, this is not a justification for being a jerk. That's my nice word, okay? What it means is I might say today might be difficult for people who've had sexual trauma. You feel free to take a walk. Feel free to just put things down and breathe. Um, I might then be more aware of who I can see having things happen. Um, I've done a lot in the past year of just watching for those signs, going over and putting a hand on his shoulder, unless I see they jerk, then a hand next to them, and just saying, go take a walk. Let's talk for five minutes after class. 
that little tiny bit of space has let people open up to me because they know, one, nothing I'm doing in this class is so important that I want you to sit there and be in pain. We can figure out content. But two, I'm on your side. Now, I am a cheerleader. So that's me. That is who I am. Think about who you are now for a second. As you look at this trauma resolution and try to think, where do I think I might fit into this puzzle? I know it's a big slide. I know there's a ton there and I hope you go back to it as you're thinking through things. Where do you fit? I believe in empowerment. That's my cheerleading side. I am 100% here for you. We are gonna go through this together. Super annoying to people who haven't even acknowledged their trauma. So I'm probably not gonna reach them. I tend to do best with those who've acknowledged it and are riding the bumpy wave. They're not sure they're gonna to get to the next level. Okay, so my next step in being a good mentor is do I know people or resources for someone that's at a different level than that. All right, someone who no longer needs the cheerleader, but still needs to understand, okay, when the world gets scary, do you have a plan for dealing with your trauma and your triggers? Same thing with neurodivergence. Many people who are autistic or have severe ADHD who come in our classrooms, they have learned how to manage themselves. They're not always looking for someone to help them at that baseline level. So do we understand where this person is? It's as easy, believe it or not, as asking, how do you manage your ADHD? What works for you? They're adults, they're not kids anymore, okay? All right, so we're gonna jump, because I always talk more than I think I'm gonna talk. What does a trauma or a neurodivergent support pattern or good mentoring looks like? It looks like this. But not everybody in this room is gonna be good at every piece of that. So what do you think it could look like in your classroom? Who has some ideas maybe of something they're trying or thinking they could attempt to be a better mentor, especially for those whose whole selves walked in as a mountain? And being them is a bigger challenge than maybe 90% of the people who sit in your class want to do what's on the syllabus and move on to the next phase of life. What do you think it looks like to be a good mentor while you're teaching? Is that the hard part? What do you think in the back? I have to go back to when I was um, a student here and the professors that made it uh, really obvious that they were open to talking to you and getting to know you and, and wanting to know what accommodations you might need at the very beginning of the semester. That made all the difference. Yeah. So do you have a way that you're letting, you know, and not, and not just a piece on your syllabus guys, that's, that's the cop out way. Like it's on my syllabus. Well, that syllabus might be really overwhelming to people who are still learning to deal with details. What is that way when they walk in that you are saying, I want your help. I want to do this better. Is it having a suggestion box on Canvas so that it's really a low risk thing for people to tell you like, hey, you've got a student in here who doesn't hear real well. Could you use the mic? Sure. Done. All right. Or did you know that you don't have subtitles on this and <laughs> I really couldn't read it? Those are little ways, okay? Maybe a suggestion box works for you, maybe it doesn't. Um, I know an amazing mentor and she takes time early on to meet one-on-one -on -one with every student. I'm not that good with time management, that would pretty much derail my whole semester trying to do that. But is that you? Could that work for you to not have a class period and instead take a few minutes to get to know people? And see, and most people are gonna come and go. They're not the one you're looking for. You're looking for that one that matches you. All right, so you get to do another quick thing and then we're gonna move on to creating your plan. Jump onto this QR code and we're going to take a little survey just to let us know how common being uncommon is. I know I really defaulted to the survey mode today, but with 25 minutes, there's not a whole lot of activities. So what you're doing in here, oh, do you need me to go back? Was I too fast? 
Just because I know where we're going doesn't mean you guys can follow. Is it being grumpy? No. You can also type this in if you really want to, but sometimes, here, do you want me to move it? Would that help? Yeah, it was awesome. Okay, so quick, this is one minute, and then we'll start looking at some results. Have you ever experienced a traumatic event, been diagnosed with a mental illness, had a weird or less understood hobby? Do you sneak off to Comic-Con? Whether your students know it or not, you're like, woof, the cosplay's gotta be good this year. I got a lot of weirdos. Um, just kidding, that was a joke because I go to Comic-Con so I can make fun of me, right? Um, have you ever felt very alone for a long period of time or hidden parts of yourself to avoid embarrassment? My son is off to seventh grade today and Boy, there was sure a lot of hiding ourselves happening in that common room as we all walked in. All right. So looking at those who were there, you can see that generally we have a fifth to a third of people who have experienced things that are actually fairly common and may have a need. Now, you might know perfectly well how to manage this. But sometimes it helps. 22% of people in this room have experienced trauma. 15%, that's pretty on par with national averages, have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Um, only 16% of you were willing to confess you have a weird hobby. 20% um, of you felt really alone. And 27% have had to hide parts of yourself in order to avoid embarrassment. You are all mature adults. What does that mean for the kids sitting in front of you? Well, what it really means is if you were willing to bring those pieces of yourself and offer that up to them, you would probably help them a lot with feeling more empowered, with feeling less alone, with feeling like their trauma could resolve over time. I think we're very much trained as professors to put on our professor parts and step up and be our professor person. I'm asking you to be human. I'm asking you to not be scared and to remember that if you are terrified, all right, we're zooming on fast, then they are even more terrified. The other thing I wanna close with is this idea that your class is a sandwich, and it's held together by bread or a piece of lettuce, so then I argue it's a salad, not a sandwich. But whatever is holding it together is you. You're the thing making that class happen. Is there a way that you can bring just a tiny bit more of yourself to class this year? Whether it's flashing a picture or a comic or some little tiny bit of you. I'm a storyteller, they hear lots of stories from me. It's not gonna work for everybody. I don't want it to work for everybody because it's not gonna work for every student. Some students are highly annoyed by my stories. That's okay, be annoyed. They amuse me plenty for both of us, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but who are you? That's where this comes from. How do you let the people for whom this core value hits their core value know I'm here and I'm for you? As we finish up today, I would like you to make note or write down three little tiny things. I want you to write down something that came up in this talk that you need to learn more about. Whether that is the science of neurodivergence or neurotransmitters, whether that is how to calm emotional reactions during class time, whatever that is, what's something you need to learn more about? Okay? What's one action you can take first day to bring your whole self to class? All right, do we need to redesign that introduction slide that you wrote your first terrified year as a professor? Okay, is it time to change that and be like, hi? Here I am as Serena in my anime costume. Okay, is it time to let your weird flag fly? Um, one thing I always tell my foster kids is we're weird and we like it that way. And it's amazing how freeing that is 
when they're like, wait, I can be anything I need to be in this house. And I'm like, sure, you probably won't even be the weirdest one as long as I'm here, okay? The last thing is I want you to think, how are you gonna evaluate your mentor mentorship this year? Um, it can be as easy as how many kids did I have a personal talk to during class time? How many unique conversations did I have? Um, it can be how many individual questions did I get back? Meaning that students feel safe coming to you. What piece of that empowerment plan are you providing to them? And how are you helping them move forward? But how are you holding yourself accountable for that? Okay? And maybe this idea of bringing your, your whole self is a little scary. Maybe there's a little anxiety about this idea or you feel like, oh my gosh, they're totally gonna laugh at you. They might if you bring your anime costume. I absolutely guarantee it. So, you know, make sure you're ready for that. Um, but maybe that's where you need to start. Like every class period, how did I bring myself to class? So that the kids who knew, they shouldn't be kids, sorry, foster mom problem. The adults and the learners who needed me knew I was a safe person. All right, you are welcome to come talk to me. I know our time is up. Here's some great references. If you have questions, I'll hang around a little bit. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.